Welcome to chapter two of the pre-recorded lecture series. Now, this chapter is relatively short. It's a summary overview chapter, and the slide deck is relatively quick. But what's important to understand about this particular chapter is that it functions as a holistic view of the whole of the text. And services marketing, the Zethmore, Bittner and Gremler textbook is based on a single theoretical conceptual model. It uses the services gaps model and its accompanying service quality, serve qual measure as the fundamental principle upon which the entire book is based. So the idea of this particular chapter is to give you an overview so that as you progress through the book, you have a context for your services theory and your broader marketing theory. So not only do you know why you're applying it, you know how the application of one particular block of information. For example, late in the textbook, we talk about various elements of the marketing mix, such as promotion. You can see with the service gap model where the theoretical ideas of integrated marketing communication fits back into the consumer experience of services. So this chapter has the role of overviewing service gap, and then we deal with the service gap in component parts across the sections of the text and the chapters that are following this one. So what is the gaps model? The gaps model is based on the idea that fundamentally, because services is intangible, it's inseparable, and there is that level of heterogeneity and consistency, the expectation someone has about a service drives their satisfaction. And what you have here is a measure of quality is expectation minus perception. And with the SurfQual model, we can literally measure that as an equation. SurfQual measures your expectations across a series of items and then asks you the very same items again in terms of what did you perceive in the service encounter. So your expectation, then the difference between what you perceive and what you expected. A positive difference, so the perception was better than your expectation, is service satisfaction. A negative experience, the service you perceived was less than what you expected, is a service failure or a negative service outcome. So this model then integrates the influences and the factors that can be working with you or against you in service delivery. For example, we've got the customer side and the company side. Now on the customer side, we have the customer gap, the gap between what you expect and what you perceive. On the company side, we have and you'll note the flowchart style nature here, there can be a gap between what the company believes the customer expects and what the customer actually expects. So we call that the listening gap, and that's the gap that is created where you don't understand your customer's needs. We can have a similar gap where you've miscommunicated to your customers. You've promised more than you're capable of delivering. So what you have promised can't be delivered, isn't delivered, and you can be delivering the customer set standards or you can be delivering the standards that you are you design. But if you don't promise properly or you miscommunicate your promise, the expectations are too high, the service isn't perceived to be of high quality. Or similarly, you can actually reverse that in terms of you can improve the perception of the service through good communication. So as with a lot of what we're going to deal with in marketing, everything is dual edge. So when we start talking about something like the customer gap, the gap between expectation and perception, we can make use of it or we can have it used against us. So this is an important thing to understand is that if the customer perceives the service to be better than they expected, this can initially be seen as positive, 
but the customer keeps changing and improving their expectations upwards, you can be delivering the same high-end, high-quality service, but the customer is not getting the same gap, the same separation between what they perceive and what they expect. So they're feeling that the service quality is diminishing, even though objectively it's the same. So what are the facets and factors that we need to examine when we're dealing with customer gap? Well, this is one of the aspects where we've got the customer side, and we'll talk about customer expectations, and we'll talk about manip the manipulations that you can undertake to ensure that your customer's expectations are within the realms of possible, probable, and acceptable. But you also have the factors of the four provider gaps lead in here. So if you don't know what the customer wants, or you don't build your product to deliver, if you don't actually deliver on your promises, and if you're promising more than you're capable of performing, these are all gaps and problems. So if I was to say to you that I would have an assessment task marked in, you would, everyone on the subject would receive feedback within 24 hours of submission, and I didn't have a team backing me up so that, and I knew that with the number of students I have, the minimum turnaround time was 72 hours, I would be over-promising. So one of the critical things in services marketing is not to overpromise, and it's not to make promises that can't be delivered. So you don't want to have to negotiate down a customer expectation after service delivery. So let's talk about provider gap one for a moment here. This is the first of the areas where you're dealing with the company's interpretation of the customer. Now, in the gap between expectation and perception, you're dealing with the customer's interpretation of the service encounter. Here, it's the framing. What do we as service designers and service providers think our customers are expecting? Now, these gaps can come about through a variety of ways. One of them is lack of market research. So we talked a bit about how market research is important in services marketing. And as an academic marketer, I can tell you that the services research track is one of the most heavily designed, carefully implemented areas where qualitative and quantitative service market research skills are highly respected. The quantitative, the high-end bulk analysis, where Statistical surveys like SurfQual, SurfPerf, it's the service performance by Brady and Conan. These are respectable tools. These are highly respected tools. Also, alongside them are aspects such as mystery shopping and ethnographic observation, where it's human skill. Very limited application of numbers very strong application of interpretation, design, thinking, observation, and analysis. So quant and qual skills are both valuable, both valuable and both valued in services marketing. Second area where you're going to end up with some provider gaps coming about is where you've got frontline employees and you don't listen to them. And this is a critical area. And this is something that goes wrong where the management believes that they understand the customer better than someone who's on the front line who deals with the customer. The people who are in close contact with the customer, the employees who are in the forward-facing, cold face positions and engage the customers day in, day out, know and hear and can feed back into the market research loop, product development and quality assurance loops if they're listened to and there's an upward communications model. Another area of gap is where there's a lack of focus on building and maintaining relationships in a service engagement. Services marketing, because it's interpersonal, because of the aspect of the human touch, the inconsistency, the fifth P of marketing, people, without that relationship focus, it tends to fall down a bit. Services can't be batch produced, distributed automatically. You can't really have the services vending machine approach. 
you're going to end up with a, if you want to succeed in services, you have an ongoing relationship engagement. And lastly, services recovery. And this is an important facet that we talk about is services go wrong. The nature of the service product delivery is that you have inconsistency, the heterogeneity, and because it's human interaction, sometimes the customer doesn't do their side of the, of the deal. They don't perform their part of the process. The service fails and you need to recover the service. And we talk a lot about service recovery and there's some interesting work that's been done in this about how we turn around a problem and not just make it into a solution, but make it into a grounds for loyalty. So when something goes wrong and it's fixed and it's fixed well or fixed appropriately, it can actually increase the level of customer satisfaction than if the problem never occurred. That said, it's not worth artificially creating problems for the express purpose of solving them. All right, provider gap number two, the second on the company side elements is an internal procedural component. This is where you have your expectations, or you have your perception of what you think the customer wants, and you're unable to translate that into the product you design and the service process you implement. This becomes particularly important where we start looking at facets like service design, where instead of having specifics, instead of using smart objective, instead of using concrete goals, we have platitudes and broad statements of high quality innovative delivery. When you try and break it down, it's like, well, what do you actually mean? And someone just chants that back at you as a mantra. Your poor service design. If you can't work out what it is you're trying to offer or how it is you're going to offer it, that becomes problematic. This is also the area where if you're lacking the customer side, look, that you're very much production orientation or a selling orientation, and you're trying to figure out how do we get these people through the door? If you've ever said the words along the lines of stupid client or these stupid customers, chances are you're lacking a customer-driven standard because you're not seeing the customer as the, the driver. You're seeing the customer as a problem that should be solved rather than the asset or rather the solution. Finally, if you've got a physical element to your service and you're not making use of it, one of the things about physical evidence and service scape is that we can all evoke visions of what we expect because we've got the expectations. So if I was to tell you that the product we're designing is a high quality restaurant with luxury fine wines, fine dining, and then I told you about the plastic seats and the disposable paper tablecloths and the disposable cutlery and the $100 bottle of wine that will be served into a plastic goblet, one of those red cup plastic goblets at that, the clash between the physical evidence and the service scape and the design and the expectations is too great. That you will run into problems if your evidence and your service scape doesn't match what it is you're trying to offer to the customer, their perceptions will be modified and their expectations will be broken by the environment they're operating in. Third level, third gap. Gap three, service performance. You've got standards, you've got designs, it's time for the rubber to hit the road and it's time to actually implement. This is an aspect where there are some problems that are not just marketing issues. This is where we need to look at issues that, for those of you who are doing management and HRM, we can draw on some of your skills here. The human resource policies, the matching the right person to the role, and we talk about things like role conflict and role stress, where um, services marketing uses a lot of emotional labor. We have to always be on, always be cheerful, always happy, nothing can go wrong. The customer, the customer doesn't care about the service provider's day, but the service provider must fake caring about the customer's life. So there's a lot of these aspects of the human resource elements that can create this gap between the standards we set 
and the service we deliver. You also have aspects such as the supply and demand and demand management. You can set a very high quality standard that you want to achieve in your design. But if you then create a high demand product, you can peak. For example, one of the challenges that we actually face with university coursework is designing a course to be, say, a small close quarters, dynamic, almost personal supervision arrangement with an expectation that we'd have a cohort of 10 to 15 students. And this being a very popular idea and the concept being popularly received, and 75 students sign up for a course that was designed for 15. Our supply and demand mismatch means that without bringing in additional human resources, we're not going to be able to deliver that service. And at the same time, if everyone was signing up because they wanted to work with a particular professor, there's only one of those professors to go around. And if you've now divided this class up into six smaller cohorts of five classes that don't get the professor and one class that does, you have a gap between what you promised and what you're delivering because you fail to match supply and demand. We also have a problem in the gap between how the service is delivered and how the service was planned if the customer has a particular role to play. And this is something I'm mindful of this semester, is that if I was to not guide you in my expectations of what you are to do in this course, we could create a huge gap here between what I believe the course would do on paper and how the course played out in practice. So the role, the fulfilling of the roles becomes an important element. Because you've got to do your part in a co-production. And because inseparability, production and consumption happening at the same time, you have to play a role in a service for the service to succeed. So the less participation a customer brings to the party, the harder it is to actually engage the customer-driven service design and standards because the customer is not playing their part that they thought that they had indicated that they would and that your service was designed around. Lastly is the service intermediary gap. Uh, this is where basically if you are relying on other factors. For example, your service delivery is fast food. You're in the fast food home delivery market. You promise 15 minutes or it's free. There's a lot of trouble on the roads, there's stop blockages, stoppages, and you can't make that delivery inside 45 minutes. Not only is the food late, it's cold. You've got a service delivery failure, but your problem was your delivery. It wasn't the problem the food was cooked properly, the problem was outside your control. So you also have these factors that you've got to bring in where other elements of the intermediaries in the process need to be modified and taken into consideration for the service to be delivered properly. All right, gap number four, the communication. We pretty much call this the service promise gap. Where you communicate with the market, where you can directly communicate with an audience, you can directly set up a set up expectations. Where it tends to break down in services is if you lack the IMC, you lack the cohesive overview of everyone on the same song sheet in terms of what you promise. This becomes a particular problem where you deal with franchises and there are multiple providers of the same service and the service differs between each franchise outlet. Now the service can differ if it's emphasized that's customizable or, or that's a feature. But if it's supposed to be standardized delivery across all the, the players, and you have five players in the one geographic region and they differ in the service implementation, or they differ in their service promises, then that becomes a critical factor because what's promised by one may not be delivered by another. We also have in the communication side the overpromise, and this is the one that's particularly important, is a lot of a lot of marketers believe that they can greatly overpromise, deliver something adequate, and feel that, well, we've got the money, we don't have to worry really. Or overpromise with the, well, where are you gonna go? What are you gonna do? 
And one of the competitors in services marketing is self-service. The do-it-yourself competes with the service provision. The last two elements here is that really need to be uh, emphasized is pricing and expectation management. Pricing is a key component of the service promise and the service communication. If you have a very high price or an above average price, you are projecting quality. You are assuming, and the market is assuming, and you are communicating an assumption of value being tied to price. This is expensive, this has got to be good. At the same time, if you are communicating a lower price, that in itself might be problematic. You may need to increase your price to match the expectation so that the customer feels that they're getting value for money, but doesn't have that nagging sensation of, well, if it's this cheap, there's got to be something wrong with it. This actually became an issue for public transport, and briefly worth mentioning is that free is not always cheap. It's not always the cheapest option. When public transport is made free, users and usage declines because people don't see its value, but also think that the other customers on the service aren't going to be the sort of customer they want to associate with. Because, well, you know, it's free, then people who, you know, people will use it all day, or kids will use it, or there'll be youth involved, or there'll be all sorts of facets to your pricing that communicate who the other market, who the other people attending the service are going to be. So that's a critically important area, is to remember that price in services plays a role and a very strong role in the IMC and promotion of the service. Lastly, the gaps analysis. So where are we going to use it? Now, across, across the course of the semester, it's going to be the framework and it's going to underpin the book. But these are some interesting questions to start thinking about when you look at a service gap analysis is, are we hitting all the marks? There are five possible areas that we could have a gap. How well are they closed on the company side? How well are we performing on each of the gap areas? Where are our strengths? Where are our weaknesses? So a gap analysis can be used as an internal analysis for a services marketing marketing plan. And on the specific service implementation, you can look at it from the point of view of market segmentation. Who is this customer? What do we know about this customer and their expectations? What is this service offer that we are making to them? Do we meet or do we exceed customer expectations? What facets of what we do across these four gaps that we control as a services marketer do we need to engage with, to examine, to understand where are, we, where are the gaps close or close uh, to perfect? Where are the changes that need to take place? Also, where are the opportunities? If we close this, if we close gap number one, do we open up gaps on two, three, and four? So we're also looking at the balancing act because the gaps model doesn't operate in isolation. So that's the gaps model. That's the overview for chapter two. It's a big chapter insofar as the conceptual frameworks that are involved are really important to you for this semester. I can guarantee you now the GAPS model will feature in the final exam because I give you a copy of the GAPS model in the final exam. It's one of the assets that you get a set of questions and you get the GAP model. That's how I do the final exam. So I can tell you up front, this is examinable. It's always examinable because it's the most critical part of the way the services is taught through this text. Now, if you've got any questions, hit me up on Twitter or connect with me across email, stephen.dan at anu.edu.au. And that's the framework, the GAPS model, the framework that we're going to be dealing with for this subject for this semester. Make use of it, have a look at it, bring it into your analysis of case studies, bring it into the way you look at services theory, and service application. How does this fit the gap, close a gap, and which gap does it relate to?